You know, some of you are actually really sad that that's the last time you're going to hear this song, isn't it? Yeah. Well, today's the moment of truth. We are in the last week of our G series where we're talking about partnership. This idea where we as a diverse group of people actually are joining hands and working together because we found something greater than us, right? We found that, that the work and the mission of Jesus here in this planet is way more important than, than anything that we could sort of do in and of ourselves. So we work together, we partner to accomplish more. Now, can I tell you, is it okay if I'm a little bit hard on you today? Thank you. And, and if you don't like that, talk to the people who just gave me permission. Um, and the reason I want to be hard on you and me and us together today is because I love you. And I believe that God wants to accomplish some pretty cool things here and through us. And the only way that that really happens and continues to happen is if we challenge ourselves and if, if we push things a little bit. So um, if we really want to be the church and we really want to make disciples as God wants us to, we have got to continue in this process as well. Amen? So we have got to become followers of Jesus in increasing ways as well. So at the end of the gathering today, you're going to have a cool opportunity to say, hey, I, I want to say yes to these five Gs, and I want to become a partner here, but I want to spend the next number of minutes trying to talk you out of doing that. So why in the world would you want to become a partner? I mean, I've told you every single week, you still belong. You can belong here. You don't have to take this step or do this thing to be a partner. You can still serve your brains out. You don't have to be a partner ministry partner here at New Hope to serve at all. You can serve with kids. You can do all sorts of things. Um, and you still have a voice at anything and everything. You, you, don't, there's no secret partner meetings with a handshake or anything like that. You can show up. You can give your, your opinion and feedback. Really, the only things you can't do if you're not a partner, you can't vote. And that only applies if we're ratifying an elder selection uh, for our annual budget. Um, and not many of you come to that meeting anyway, so it doesn't apply to most of you. And uh, if there's a vote on a new lead pastor, and I don't plan on going anywhere for a while unless you guys, like, kick me out. So th th there's that. And um, you can't lead at the highest levels. We expect our elders, our staff, and ministry leaders to be partners. Uh, and so if you don't aspire to any of those things, you know, why would you do this? Well, the reason I think you should is because, really, partners are, are the foundation. They carry the weight. Partners become the load-bearing walls, if you will. Now, not everybody's supposed to be part of the foundation, a a at least at this point in time, because there's some of, some of us that, that can't support that weight at this point in time. A and so for some of us, we need a place where we can come and, and not a lot is expected of us, and that is okay. But a bunch of us need to be this, or we won't accomplish what God is asking. So, so let's just look at the five Gs, and, and at the end of the gathering today, you can become a partner here with us here at New Hope if you can answer yes to these five Gs. And this is sort of the progression that we've gone through over these last five weeks now. So the first week is we ask the question, are you experiencing God's grace? And this just means, do you know Jesus? Have you accepted his sacrifice for your sin? Um, and, and this is a beautiful one, isn't it? This is something that God gives us. He sent his son to die so that we could be forgiven of our sin and have new life. Are you experiencing God's grace? The next G we asked, are you growing spiritually? Are, are you getting there? Because I don't want to know that you prayed a prayer 15 years ago to become a Christian, and nothing has changed since then. And it doesn't mean that, that every day or every year things have gotten better, and you've, you, you, but are you getting there? I mean, you know, there's ebbs and flows, and there's struggles, and there's, there's low points in the journey too. But, but is there, over time, is there some kind of progression where, where you can see growth in your life? Are you growing spiritually? And then, we ask the question, are you participating in the group levels of the church? 
are you sharing life with others, this basically means. So on Sundays, are you coming? Or are you participating like this? Are you serving with others so you have relationships like that? Uh, are you the kind of person who throughout the week, in various ways, whether it's through a small group or something else, you're just connecting with others who are part of this body to share life together? And then last week, we asked this question, are you using your gifts for ministry? Because all of us have gifts. God has given every one of us a gift. Are you using those things for the ministry here in this place? And we talked about it. We actually need about 100 people per Sunday just to make things happen. That's crazy. But thank you so much for the ways that you guys step up to make things happen. In last week, we, we actually issued, if you weren't here, a 90-day serving challenge. And we left it in the worship program. So on the back side of your connection card, it's still there. Uh, and that's what it looks like, that slide. And there's just a lot of the ways for Sunday in particular that, that things happen. Uh, stuff with kids, making things happen behind the scenes. There's all kinds of things here. And, and if you weren't here last week, or maybe you've just, you know, needed another week to think more about it, if, if God is sort of prompting you to engage or be involved, would you look this over and maybe circle one of these and put your name on the front and drop it? In, in one of the tall red boxes, because here's the cool thing, and here's what we're saying. Try something. Give it a chance. And at the end of 90 days, we promise we will ask you, hey, is this the area for you? And if you say no, you don't have to keep doing it. It's not a sign in blood, lifelong commitment. But we will ask you the question, okay, what do you want to try next? Because we want everyone to plug in in ways that make sense for them. Now, this leads us to the last sheet, but before I show you what that is, let me just say this. Do you see the progression here? That, that we actually get to experience the grace of God. Jesus died for us. God gives us this incredible gift. And then, and then we get to grow. We experience that more and more, and this becomes something bigger and fuller in our lives. And then we actually get to share this with others, and we, we participate just in community and relationships, which is another incredible gift that God gives us. And then we actually get to give back to that. We get to, to use our gifts, which remember last week we talked about, hey, remember, it's a gift. So treat it like it's a gift, because isn't it fun to use our gifts? I mean, if you're good at something, don't you enjoy doing it? And so we get to participate. And now at the very end, here's, here's the last G. Are you giving generously? And some of you are going, ah, I can see why you're trying to talk us out of this, right? Be because uh, this is the one that's a sticking point for so many people. But you need to understand that Jesus talks about giving more than anything else other than the kingdom of God. And by the way, guys, thanks so much. Here's a group of people who are giving everything to like pack up and move to, to pretty much like a foreign country that's the South, right? So that's kind of scary. So we'll pray even more for you because of that. Uh, but Jesus talks a lot about this idea of giving. Now, uh, we, I've mentioned this book every single week. And uh, the section, the study, the week on giving in this book is worth the $6 we're selling these at the bookstore for. So if you haven't gotten one yet or you don't have people to go through it with, grab one of these, get some people, go through this. And, and so, so listen to this incredible thing that I just want to read you just a, a few sentences from this little book on giving. Treasures not only reveal your heart, they shape it as well. Isn't that great? Have you ever heard that where you want to see what someone values? Look in their checkbook. Face two pizza, face two pizza, face two. Yeah. Sorry, Dan. I didn't mean to <laughs> shine light on you like that, buddy. Uh, but, but it's not just that they reveal our heart, they shape it as well. So if we start to treasure something, if we start to, to invest there, that actually shapes who we're becoming. Isn't that cool? Our hearts are naturally shaped by greed and possessiveness. We are by nature clutchers. Mine is one of the first words a child learns. If we want to have our hearts reshaped in the image of Christ, we need to train them to regularly engage in exercises that will help us do what we cannot do by willpower alone. We need a tangible practice that will help us say money 
You are not God in my life today. Giving is just such a practice. Now, some people may say, but it's so hard. No. I'll tell you what's hard. Raising money, taking a bunch of time off work, and going to a part of the world you've never, ever been before to help share and spread the love of Jesus like John and Laura Markle just did, that's hard. Or, or raising thousands and thousands of dollars and hopping on a bicycle and riding 500 miles in oppressive heat over mountains so that, that people can know and you can shine light on this modern-day slavery issue, that is hard. That's what a bunch of people from here did. What we're talking about within this partnership series, these five Gs are the foundational building blocks that God asks of all who seek him. So maybe some of you will decide to join hands and hearts and partner with us, even as I do my best to talk you out of drinking the Kool-Aid today, or maybe Gatorade. So we're on our last one. It's blue. It's blue. Let's pray. God, I pray today that nobody in this room, even me, would take any steps, would, would sign for anything uh, because I think they should. Or even, God, because they think they should. May everything we do be in obedience to your word and the leadership of your spirit and the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. And it's in his powerful name that we pray, act, and live. Amen. As we jump in and we look at this last G, um, we actually talked more in depth about the discipline and practice of generosity uh, at the end of January. So as a companion to this morning, if you weren't here at New Hope at that point in time, if you weren't here that Sunday, um, if you just need a refresher, we want you to know that we've uploaded that to the teaching section of our website, so you can go to nhloud.com and check that out. And, and if you don't have a fast internet connection or an internet connection at all, we're actually giving that DVD away. So if you want to think more about this, we want to help you do that. And so at the doors afterwards, there will be DVDs if you need one. And again, it's on our website as well. So let's jump in. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15, the, the Bible says this. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should give what they have decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the thing we see here, just a couple ideas. The first one is, you reap what you sow. So if you, if you sow a little bit, you're going to get a little bit back. If you, if you put a lot of seed out, you're going to get more in return. And some think when you talk about this in relationship to giving like the Bible does, that it's counterintuitive, right? Like, if I have money and I'm more generous with it, the end result there is that I have less. People, we, we, we intuitively think that. But is, is this true in any other area of life? Do we apply this logic anywhere else? Because in business, don't, don't you hear this all the time? You got to spend money to make money, Right? I mean, so the idea of, of using our resources and, and getting a return makes sense there. If you're a farmer, you don't say, oh, I'm going to keep that seed in the silo or the barn because we don't want to put it out there in the field, right? You actually, you actually sow it. So th there's this idea biblically with our generosity that, that God is telling us to be generous, to actually to, to sow, to plant seed, to give in a generous way. And then, then don't miss this, because this is the most important thing. And any time, you know, people go, oh, I've got to talk about giving in. Twice a year. And this time only because we're at the end of our partnership series, and this is an important piece for this. Giving is, or at least should be, a cheerful act. Don't miss what the Bible says. God loves a cheerful giver. Now, if... Giving opens the door to divine trust where, where God says, hey, when I give something to you, you are faithful to do with it and use it as I want you to. Um, it, it actually results in more. Shouldn't this be something that excites us? So giving should be a cheerful thing. Now, let me just ask this as we, as we think about this, this start of the text. Um, if you were God, and thank God you're not God, but in this one instance, let me just ask you, if you were God, and you, it was all yours anyway, and you were 
choosing who to bless. If you gave something to somebody and they kept it, would you be inclined to continue to give generously to them? Okay. Now, if you were God and everything was yours and you gave to somebody and they were really open-handed and said, God, I just want to bless and use this however you want me to, would you be inclined to give to them? It just makes sense, doesn't it? The text continues. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now, notice the all here. Isn't this cool? That God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God wants us to have what we need in an abounding way so that we can succeed in everything that we do in every good work. And then this, the text continues, As it is written, He that scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. So, so here we see that God himself is generous to the poor, to those in need, and, and he, he is generous with his righteousness. He gives us all his grace, this wonderful gift from God. The text continues, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, have you ever heard or even said this? Ah, the church wants my money. Anyone ever heard anyone say that? Of course, you guys never have, but anyone ever heard that? We have, haven't we? Um, and, or this maybe, right? All the church talks about is money. Actually, it would be a truer statement to say that all that Jesus talks about is money because he talks about it again more than anything other than the kingdom of God. We only talk about it a couple times a year. Let me set the record straight. God does not need your riches. God doesn't need them. And let's play, pay close attention here to what the text is telling us. Listen to those words again. Now he who supplies the seed for the sower and bread for food also supply, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What's the text telling us here? It's all his. The idea that, that God needs or wants our riches is actually a broken thought. The, the biblical thinking is that everything is God's, and he gives it to us. So it's all his. He, he gave everything we have to us, and he wants us to use it for him. And when we engage in this, beautiful things happen. The text continues, this, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. So God doesn't need your riches, but God blesses obedience. Um, what, is, what is obedience accomplishing in, in this part of the text we just looked at? Well, it was supplying the needs of God's people, right? When, when here we see people are faithful, they're generous, it supplies the needs of God's people. Then people are, are thanking God as a result of this, and then people are even praising God. S saying it and doing it must go together. And I love how the text sort of concludes there when it says, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Now, some of us would say, well, if I'm not obedient in my generosity, if, if I'm not faithful to give, it only hurts me, right? Because, because I'm missing out on God's blessing. I'm missing out on God being able to trust me and bless me with more. So we approach it in this way and say, well, I'm, I'm the only one who loses here. But this isn't true. Because as a church, 
We're in this together. And if I'm not faithful or you're not faithful, guess what? God doesn't just call us as individuals to things. He calls us corporately to stuff too, doesn't he? There are things he asks of us that he wants us to do. And when a bunch of us say, I'm not going to participate, I'm not going to be generous, what ends up happening is the things that God is asking us all to do together, we can't. We can't because the lack of obedience of some of us lead to us not being able to do the things that God has given us and asked us to do. Now, some of you are going, okay, well, what are those things I want to know more? You know what? Take me to lunch sometime. I'd love to talk more with you about this. I don't have an expense account, so I need you to take me to lunch. Um, and then the passage ends like this. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Oh, I love that. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So we start with this idea that God doesn't need your riches. He doesn't need my riches. But God blesses obedience. And then here, here's the, the last thing. You need God's blessing. Amen? We need God to bless us. Now, when your kids are disobedient, do you give them everything they've just complained about and wanted? No, right? So if we need God's blessing and we want God's blessing, isn't obedience part of the pathway to get there? And then this passage, God has given us the indescribable gift of his son. In the Lord's Prayer, the, the Bible talks about that we have to forgive others when they sin against us so that, that God will forgive us of, of, um, of our sin. Now, isn't, isn't that cool? Because when somebody wrongs us, that's probably pretty small in comparison to all of the stuff that we have done that God is gracious with us about. And if God has given so much an indescribable gift, how can we not do our part? How can we not be generous as a part of this? So why does generous giving matter? Let me connect a few dots for you. Would that be all right? At New Hope, we pay, I just looked up some stats. Just want to give you some stats. At New Hope, we pay pastors 30% less than the national average. So we pay our staff 30% less than they would make it at, on average at every other church. That doesn't factor size in because... Um, this was like done over, the survey was done over 5,000 churches, and it's the main sort of thing that talks about this. Uh, so for a church our size, the, the percentage is, is bigger. And don't mishear me here. No one has ever complained to me, and I've never ever in my whole life complained about what I did or didn't make. But I just want you to see that. At New Hope, we have two fewer pastoral staff members than we need to adequately care for our congregation. They actually say a church our size would typically have five full-time pastors. They say it takes about uh, a pastor to 100 people to, to provide adequate care. Um, we hosted our first ever VBS last year, and it was awesome. And that Sunday when we had the stage packed with kids— wasn't that cool? Um, and we've been planning one for this year, too, but we don't have the money to do it. And before anyone comes to me and says, hey, you know what, I have a little bit extra I want to give to make that happen, hear this, we're actually $21,651 behind budget this year, which actually means we were doing amazing through Mother's Day, and then summer happened. Um, and, and so over these last couple months, uh, we, we did a good job because you guys were so faithful. We actually had about $9,000 in reserves. But when you're $21,000 behind, it means not only do you cut some things, but it means you spend through your reserves in order to survive, uh, which puts us at a place now where we go, we don't have any reserves, and we have another summer month still to come. And so the result of that is even if someone said, hey, here's $3,000, let's do a VBS, we'd go, Really? Can we actually do that, knowing that, that if August is like July and June and some of May, that we won't be able to pay our mortgage or we'll have to have our pastors and staff hold paychecks? I don't, I don't think we can do that. So if you want to do the things that we've planned to do, please give to the budget because they're all in there. 
So here's, here's what I want to talk to you guys about. Let's, let's start landing the plane. We have our lovely small container here. And uh, Kevin Haggerty introduced me to this place over in Mansfield called Cheddar's, which is one of his favorite places to eat. And I went the first time, and I loved my experience. And so Bethany and I, on a date night, decided, I, I'm like, you got, we got to go to Cheddar's. Great food, low prices. And so we walk into Cheddar's. I don't know if you've ever, we've all experienced this at one point or another, right, in, in our dining experiences. We walk in, and they seat us instantly, and it was busy, so I was, I was curious about this. But where they seated us, it looked like the, the training area for remedial servers that didn't really know what they were doing yet. And so we're sitting there, and we're sort of looking around, and we start to get nervous because we actually were, had something else we were doing that night. And, um, and, and we looked over at the couple across the way from us, and they sort of had, we, our eyes met, and they were like waiting for their bill for half an hour, and it, you know what I mean? It was just bad. And we had this initial inclination that I believe now is leading God's spirit saying, you should get out of here right now, but we stayed. Well, after about 20 minutes of, of being at Cheddar's with no one even coming to, to say hi or do you want a drink, we actually flagged somebody down and said, hey, uh, who's our server? And this guy was really nice and we were really praying it was him, not the couple others, but lo and behold, this, this girl came out who we'd never even seen before in this section in our 30-minute wait so far, and, and not even, hey, I'm really sorry I was busy, but uh, do, you want a, do you want a drink? And we're actually like, well, we can place our full order since we've been here for long enough to have memorized your menu. So we put our order in and then waited. The whole time we were there, there was no refills on our drinks. Um, our, our appetizers came out with the meal cold because they'd been ready long before. She just didn't bring them out. Uh, and, and to top it all off, after this really one of the worst dining experiences we've ever had. Um, she brings the bill out, and, and, and it's, it's one thing, and then we give her our, our debit card, and she runs it, and it comes back, and it's $5 more. So she just somehow magically tacked on an extra $5, which took another 15 minutes to figure out. And so for the second time in my whole life, you know what I did? I gave no tip. Because I was mad. Now, the whole idea of, of tipping is an interesting thing, isn't it? Because we, we all tip, but, but what, what do tips look like? Tips look like we go somewhere to a restaurant a lot of times, and, and we wait to see how the service is, and we give based on that. It's not altogether different than how a lot of us approach church, right? It's like, hey, I'll go. If the service is good, I may give a little bit more. If it's not so good, or if Rob talks forever, I may give a little bit less. Um, but basically, it's this unplanned way that we engage. We, we didn't really bring much. We didn't really think this through. And I have a little bit in my, in my pocket, and I'll kind of give based on how the service goes. And, and, you know, it's small, so even if we're generous, it's really not that much, right? And then we have the next one. Um, which is tithes. And, and I'm not going to talk to you about this one. I'm actually going to have Al and Kathy come up and share with you about this one. So come on up, guys. Welcome them to the stage. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Vermilia, and this is my wonderful husband, Al. Al is the eye candy, right? He is, yeah. Yeah. He's the talker of the two of us, so. Um, but I, Rob and I got to talking about this at a swim event, of course, and he knows how passionate I can be and Al can be about um, tithing, and it wasn't always that way, trust me. We were tippers there for quite a while, and um, prior to that, we were the ones who Rob probably overheard saying that churches only want your money, and... Um, I think when Al and I both started coming to New Hope when we came here as a family, it was about six years ago. And um, for the longest time, we sat in the back where we still tend to sit, and we fell into the category of the visitors. You know, I'm sorry. Um, when they say, you know, put your envelope in the tall red box, but don't do that if you're a visitor or if you're a first-timer here, we um, claimed that status for quite a while. And 
you know, a lot of you probably still do that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, but then a challenge sort of came about. Jim Ford stood up here and talked about um, tithing and how it can really bless you and change your life, similar to how Rob's shared with you today. And something about that service just touched my heart, and I really wanted to try it. But there was no way that we were going to give 10% of our income. That's crazy, right? Um, and anybody that does that must be rich. And so we decided that we would try to give like 20 bucks, you know. And even that, I was just like, man, that's 80 bucks a month. That's our phone bill or something, right? So I didn't even know how we were going to do that. Um, but we decided to go ahead and give it a try. And after the service, we both agreed on it, $20. You know, we're going to try it. Sorry, Bethany. And um, so we tried that for a little while. And lo and behold, we could still pay our bills, you know. And I don't know where it changed for us. I try to think back. I had heard many speeches um, up here from various people. One that stood out in my mind was when Bud Stanton talked about um, spoke from the book of Malachi where the Lord tells us to test him and see, you know, give us, give him our tithe and see if he will not pour out all the blessings um, upon us. And that really touched me. And I thought, okay, you know, we've got to just try this, just see if we can give 10%. So we started giving a, a full 10% tithe of our income. And not only did we not go broke, um, the the blessings in our life have increased so many that I couldn't even stand up here and tell you. Rob knows it would take me hours, <laughs> and I won't do that to you. But um, our bank account, I mean, I don't, I'm not, by no means this isn't me. It's all God, you know, has grown so much. Neither of us have changed jobs. In fact, Al is self-employed. I work two days a week as a nurse. We don't have wonderful jobs or anything. We're just like all of you. Some of you may have wonderful jobs. But, um, I have a wonderful job. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I knew you did. Um, but we are just like every one of you, and except for we, st we took a leap of faith and decided we're going to try this. And we have been blessed time and time again, not only in our finances, but our family has grown from two at the time to four children, which is our newest nugget Bethany took out in the hallway. <laughs> And um, we have just been blessed so significantly in our lives. Um, there's really nothing magical about it except for God. And the funny thing is I laugh when Rob talked about in every other area you have to give in order to receive. But for some reason here at church, we are so hesitant to do that. And we think, well, I'm not giving my money. I'll give my time like he talked about last week and maybe I'll serve a little bit but I am not letting anybody touch my money. And it's such a funny concept because once you can finally take that leap of faith and trust God with your money, you will be blessed beyond belief. And there's no other way that you can experience that except for to just try it. And I encourage everybody out there who hasn't tried it yet, I, I laugh at it because I see how it works, you know? Um, but I encourage you to just try it. And also one other thing that has always touched me is you know, when we talk about storing up our treasures, like Rob talked about, all of us are here for a common reason, and it's because we love God, and we want our heavenly treasures. We don't need treasures here on earth. Um, and if you can just take that leap of faith and try to try the tithe, try the 10% of your income, go all in and just try it, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. You will find not only treasures here on earth, um, but so many more riches up in heaven. So... That's our story. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, I Candy. Yeah. You know, and the interesting thing, isn't it? If, if you live here, if you do this, it's really easy to look back this way, kind of like shaking your finger, forgetting that you used to do this too. We all did, right, at one point. Um, and, and also being really proud of ourselves that we're here instead of, Looking to here. <gasps> There's more? This one is really all about our treasure. Um, and, and, and so instead of saying, okay, God, I'm going to follow this rule, and I'll give a tenth, a tithe of my income, it, it, it then becomes about, 
not a rule, but a relationship. And, and, and we have a posture instead of saying, I'll do the bare minimum. And we say, God, what are you asking of me? Whatever it is, what, what are you asking of me? And it, it, may be, it may be different. It may be more. It may be whatever. And, and the thing I love about this is it really addresses this question of what is our functional Savior? Because we, we come to a place like this and we sing songs and we say, God, we love you. We, we want to live for you. But then what happens in our daily lives? Is, do we think that our money's going to save us? Or, or if we just had the right job, that's going to save us? Or do we look to God? Do we treasure and value him above everything else? So th- these are some ways that, that we do behave. And, and I just want to, in closing, ask, how could we behave? So if you're someone who, who doesn't give it all or maybe just tips God— Here's the question I want to ask you today. What would it look like for you to have skin in the game? I don't know what that's like for you. Is it five bucks? Is it 20 bucks? Whatever it is. What would it look like for you to say, I, you know, for me, this is a huge step of generosity, even though it may not add up to all that much. This is me having skin in the game. And, and this is really what are you, are you giving generously is all about. Do you have skin in the game? Are, are you telling God that you trust him and and are going to trust him in increasing measure. For those of you who have never done this, it's really, really easy to think like this. I could never do that. Well, if this and this and that all kind of fell into place, or if if we could, you know, take this other step, then we could do this. Um, Here's what I want to say to you. Um, I've never talked to anyone who said, I trusted God in this way, and, and I, I couldn't do it, or my finances fell apart. I've just never heard that story. And so we actually want to put God's money where his mouth is because this is the only thing in the Bible that, that as Kathy said, God says, test me in this. If, challenge me, test me, do it, and see if I won't bless you. And so like we did last week with the 90-day the serving challenge, we want to issue a 90-day giving challenge because One, I want you to see that this is possible. And two, I want you to experience the blessings that only come when we engage at this level and really trust God. And so here's the challenge. If you would commit to tithe for 90 days, and you can write that right on your connection card. I'm going to do it. If you want to put the amount down that you're going to give, that's, you know, whatever. At the end of 90 days, if God has not blessed you in some way, we'll give it all back. So you can actually try this risk-free because we believe that strongly that God's word is true and that God is faithful. Um, What could we do over here? This is crazy. So here's the challenge here. And we're going to talk to you about this a number of times over the next number of weeks because I'm really excited about this. Do you know that, that we're turning 10 at the end of September? This is... We have three people who are excited. John Carroll and Mary Colas, thanks for your excitement. New Hope would not exist today, and it certainly wouldn't exist in the way that it does if there weren't people who were willing to sacrifice so that this church could exist. There were people that we don't even know who gave financially to make things happen. And as we turn 10, I've been wondering and thinking and praying about how could we as a body sacrifice so that other people could know Jesus and so that other churches could happen? And so here's what I want to challenge you guys with. We're going to actually take a one-time, it's not going to be in every year, it's a one-time special offering on our 10-year anniversary. So you have two full months, because it's the last Sunday of September the 30th, uh, to think and pray about this. What could you give up between now and then to sacrifice so that you can give a one-time gift? And, and just because I'm crazy, here's what I was thinking. Okay, 10 years, and I ha- it's not like we have it in our bank account. We certainly don't. But I've been thinking, you know, what would it look like for Bethany and I to say, over 10 years, what if we gave $100 per year? So at the 10-year anniversary, what would it look like if we could somehow, and we're trusting God in this because we don't have it, and, and there's no, you know, path that I can see it coming to us. But what would it look like for us as a family to give $1,000? And, and we're certainly not, you know, if you, if you want to give five bucks, we're going to say yes, that'll be fine. But well, I'm just thinking crazy. What if a hundred of us said, you know what, I could beg, borrow, steal, scrimp, save, sacrifice, 
and give $1,000. Do you know what that would mean? Let me just say, we could actually, because the, the deal is we want to take half of it and actually give it to Converge in their church planning fund because that's what gave us money to help start all three of our campuses. And we want to take the other half and encumber it to whatever the project that God leads us to next. If we could do something like that, we would actually have enough money to resource two brand new churches for an entire year. Think about that. I mean, I know it's a ton of money, and it's a huge sacrifice, but again, we wouldn't be here if others hadn't done this. So I want you to think about that and pray about that, and whatever that looks like for you is fine. So even if I do give generously, why should I do this partner thing here at New Hope? Let me connect one more dot. The plane's coming down fast. We're coming in for our landing. This week, my son came to his mom and, and said, Mom, when am I getting my new Bible? And, and Bethany said, well, Christopher, you have your Bible. You have your kid's Bible. And he's like, yeah, but it's not the real Bible. It's, it's a kid's story Bible. So here's my son, and this is a selfish thought, but here's my son who's passionate about having his own Bible so he can read the Word of God. And then one day this week, because Bethany and Christopher needed our vehicle, they were dropping me off here at the church, and Christopher said, Dad, I need to go into the church with you. And, and we walked in, and, and he actually walked over to this back door where there's a light panel where you can put different light settings on. And, and my son pointed up, and the, one of the light settings is prayer, so it's a little darker in here, and he pointed at it. didn't say any words. He just pushed the button, and the prayer light setting came on. And he took my hand... And we walked down this aisle, and we walked over to the front, and my just seven-year-old boy knelt down here in the middle of this aisle, and he laid his face on the floor because there was something he wanted to talk to God about with me. And I tell you what, I was sitting here in this chair, and I just had tears streaming down my cheeks thinking, whatever it was that Bethany and I have been doing that's right, because there's been a lot of wrong, I'm sure— and whatever it is that happens in this place that caused Christopher to feel like this is where he can come and does come to talk and interact with and experience God was something that moved me. And something that I believe is worth partnering together in. It, it's it's uh, because of us, it's because of you that this kind of thing happens with my son and happens with your kids and grandkids. Wesley says it this way, Give me ten men that hate nothing but sin and love nothing but God, and we will change the world. With this whole partnership thing, we need to know who we can count on, and we need to know who we can call on. And some of you are not there yet, and that's okay. But for the rest of you, our kids and the work of the kingdom is far too important to float around aimlessly and not hear the call of God to us all. And don't do this for any other reason than you have heard from God through his word and are agreeing to it. We're, we're going to sing the song that we started off with, All to You. This is not an emotional song response kind of thing to do. This is something you're going to do in obedience to God. And if that means uh, someone else and other people aren't doing it, that's great, and you have to climb over them, and they're mad at you, and they push you, that's probably a good picture. That's what part, it's like, I'm in this come hell or high water. I'm going to say, yeah, I've, I've experienced God's grace. I've grown, and I'm growing spiritually. I'm committed to the group levels of this church. I'm going to do life together with these people. I'm going to use my gifts for ministry, and I'm going to give generously, whatever that looks like for you. If you can answer yes to those five Gs, you can sign up. And here's what we're going to do again. Please, please don't treat this as an emotional thing, because the, the first time you, you, you say, yeah, I did it, and then we say, hey, but you're not, you're not participating in this way, that's going to suck. So only do this if you're committed. So when we, I'm going to pray for us, and, and we're going to, we're going to sing this last song. And we have a silhouette of our church building on, on either side here with a bunch of pens. 
And we're going to ask you, if you're going to do this, to sign neatly because we need to actually see what your name is to put it on our official church record for ministry partners. So if you just scribble your name there, it's going to make it hard on us. And by us, I mean Vicki, and she's going to get mad. And you don't want that. So as we sing this song together, if, if you're someone here who says, you know what? You can count on me. You can call on me. I, I can answer yes to those five things, and I want to be a partner here in this place. During this song, we just invite you to come up and sign your name in one of these churches and join in hands and join in hearts to accomplish far more together than we ever could by ourselves. So, Father, today we thank you in Jesus' name for who you are and, God, for what you call us to. Lord, we, we apologize for being the kinds of people who, who tip you. Or, or, God, even the kinds of people who get arrogant in our tithing and say, eh, that I, I'm doing everything I need to do. So, Father, I just ask today that, that you would help us to give it all to you because, God, you've given everything for us. And, Lord, I just thank you through this series for the people that you've really impressed upon and spoken to about being partners here at New Hope. God, the people who really want to be the ones who we can count on and call on. So, God, I just ask as, as we sing this final song and as we conclude this series together today that you would continue to speak to our hearts. And whether that means we've got to climb over others to do it or it means we just got to sit because we're not ready to do it, that's fine. Because, God, if we had just 10 of us who hated nothing but sin and loved nothing but God, we could change the world for our kids and our grandkids and everybody else. We pray that that would be something we see in increasing measure. In Jesus' name, amen.